2022 International Open Seminar on Semiotics. This is a tribute to Don Dealey on the fifth anniversary of his passing. So whether you are watching us live or enjoying the recording at a later time, we are delighted that you've all decided to spend this time with us. My name is Tim Troutman. I'm uh, on the board of directors with the Lyceum Institute. And along with uh, Yulia Nikitenko, uh, who is a collaborating member of the IEF, the Institute for Philosophical Studies, we're pleased to be hosting this inaugural ceremony for what will certainly be a monumental conference over the course of this upcoming year. As already noted, 2022 marks the fifth anniversary of John's passing. It also marks the 80th year of his arrival. Those who knew him best would likely tell you that John would have us focus on developing the way of signs towards the flourishing of a truly postmodern philosophic age, rather than celebrating his life. We found, however, no downside to the proposition that we aim to accomplish both of these at the same time. So this seminar seeks to render homage to his genius and to carry on the legacy of his work. Professor Dealey spent a lifetime studying semiotics and fostering a network of semioticians from all over the globe. In that same spirit, we have invited a number of distinguished experts in that same field in order to facilitate an accessible environment towards those aforementioned ends. Through a series of presentations on semiotics and its history, with particular care for Dr. Dealey's unique historical perspective, while both rising to meet the unique challenges that face the field of semiotics in today's world and to persuasively demonstrate its critical role for the future of philosophical progress, if indeed there will be progress made, seeing as we do that this is exactly what Dr. Dealey would have wanted and knowing no better way to honor him than to continue in this very enterprise. Not only in respect to the quality of philosophical expertise, but in the quantity of words per sentence, which in his honor, I am pleased to offer this very one, clocking in right around 166 words. Yes, I counted. Now, with my perhaps ill-advised humor out of the way, allow me to turn the floor over to Yulia Nikitenko. Thank you very much, Tim. And uh, we are infinitely grateful to all of you, dear guests, to all people supporting our initiative, to every lecturer and commentator, to those who were giving their scientific advice, helping to organize and plan the sessions, helping to disseminate information. Without you and without our dear audience, of course, the seminar couldn't come true. And although now we are not able to mention every person by name, you may get acquainted with everyone on the seminar's homepage. Also, it is significant to note that by means of being in the board of institutions of the International Open Seminar for Semiotics, we at the Institute for Philosophical Studies are in uh, alignment with the Coimbra Group's university's commitment to envisaging the future together at the international level in ways that benefit the United Nations 2030 agenda, as the Institute for Philosophical Studies believes to be the case with the initiative as regards the drive we are in the planetary body to fulfill five of 17 sustainable development goals, as it is possible to read also on our homepage. And now we invite you all to watch the life and work of John Dealey, a video based on the interview with Dr. Dealey, which was conducted by Professor Elliot Gaines in 2001 and made public in 2021. Uh, the full interview can be played in the auditorium of our web page. We are indebted to Professor Elliot Gaines and Professor Farouk Saif for the existence and usage authorization of both John Dealey and interview and uh, the life and work of John Dealey. The later video was 
was produced for a presentation at the 2017 Semiotic Society of America conference. However, all of us will bear witness to, be, to the fact that it has gone beyond that day. So let's enjoy the video right before Tim Trotman gave the floor to Brooke Williams Dilly, whose company brings us much growth and how hard to joy. Uh, let's see the video. Semiotics is a name, simply a name given to a form of knowledge in one sense. Um, so what do you need in order to have semiotics? Well, you have to have <coughs> thought being given to the subject matter of signs. But <coughs> you have the question of what a sign is, and assuming that there is such a thing as sign, which of course there is, there's a question of how do signs act, because you only know things, any kind of things, through their action. I mean, if you want to study fruit flies, you've got to watch them behave. Those sensible things that we pick out to say there's a sign, <laughs> when you become conscious of how it functions as a sign, you find out that if you take that sign, put it under a microscope, subject it to chemical analysis, there's nothing in the physical structure that actually makes it be a sign. In order for it to be a sign, and for us to say there's a sign, it has to be something that is functioning within our awareness to make us think of something other than itself. Now, the connection between that thing and the other than itself is actually invisible. It's a relationship. And like any relationship, it can't be seen or touched. All we can see or touch are things that are involved in relationships. things that semiotic consciousness brings about and why there is a different climate, say even for the study of history in this postmodern context, is because the old idea was you got fact on one side, you got fiction on the other, and ne'er the twain shall meet. You know? What you got is it fact or is it fiction? My Gold Hume's idea, you know? Does the book concern matters of fact or mathematics? If not, consign it to the flames. <laughs> Or you get the idea, like the woman asked me, excuse me, when she found out I was writing a history of philosophy, hasn't that already been written, you know? <clears throat> there is a difference between fact and fiction, but it's not just a, you know, there's a, there's a difference between the United States and Mexico. There's a boundary, but by golly, the boundary has done a tremendous amount of shifting over time. And so reality is like that, you know? What's real at one time can be fiction at the next, and what's fiction one time at the next time can be real. Now, how can that be? Come on, facts are facts. Well, not so fast, you know? When you say facts are facts, you're appealing to the basic idea of scholastic realism, that there are things which are what they are independently of how we think, believe, or feel.
Okay, great. Uh, thanks again to um, Yulia for introducing that and to uh, Dr. Saif uh, for putting that together. Um, today, we're, we're fortunate to be joined by a number of distinguished guests, and we're going to bring them on uh, in the interest of time. However, we are going to um, forego the formal introductions. All of their bios are going to be available on the, the auditorium website, of course and you'll be getting to know them more over the course of the year. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna just go ahead and, and introduce um, someone who perhaps stands in least need of introduction here, uh, Dr. Brooke williams Dealey. I think the microphone is muted. There you go. Good. Should be okay now. Okay. Muito obrigada. Now that means in Portuguese, thank you very much for your presence. I say this and I open with these ceremonies because muito obrigada were the first Portuguese words I ever learned. And I learned them in Coimbra. I learned them in, in a, a, a place that is very, very dear to my heart, Portugal. Only later did John become a Fulbright professor in Brazil. Now, I also say at, on, this, on this very day, ha, have a happy Coptic Christmas. Feliz Natal, we say in Portuguese, in honor of, of Farouk, who is a Coptic Christian. I wish you, I wish you this, this very day. It's often been asked me how John and I came together. And I have written about this at, in print at various points, but let me tell you the continued true story. I was alone and not part of the Catholic world at that point in my life although I knew I had been inspired enough to have my dissertation on Jacques Maritain before me to write in the basement. And I wrote what I had within me to say. I took on his critics of the right and of the left because Jacques was the type of thinker, philosopher, that was controversial on both sides in the days that he, during World War, in the days of World War II and so forth. And here he himself took the position of being sometimes on the right, sometimes on the left on given issues. And his whole point was an integral wholeness of, in the quest for truth that goes beyond this kind of div div divisiveness. And he expanded his thinking and became, as a matter of fact, the, the presider over the Declaration of the Rights of Man and during the United Nations. So my inspiration came from reading Jacques. And while he was still alive in, in 1972, I penned a letter to him. By then he was a, a a superstar and all the literary people in the world and so forth were writing him letters. I wanted him to know that I was giving his wife, Raisa Maritain, special attention on the influence she had on his life. I received back from the secretary who happened to be from Brazil, um, a letter that this deeply moved Jacques, especially what I said about, especially what I said about Raisa and also, that he encouraged me as a young American because he was very devoted to young Americans. So that was the be all and the end all. And it took a, a few years later for the book to reach the press. And one day I received a note in the mail about the third annual American Maritime Association meeting. I didn't know such an, an organization existed. So there finally I came and I met John at that conference and I met others at that conference whose, whose work I had already read. Now, John Dealey at that conference, hmm. He knew something about John of St. Thomas, you tell me? 
Jean Poinceau. Well, who's Jean Poinceau, I wonder? You know, I've heard of John of St. Thomas hundreds of times in the writing of, of, of Jacques Maritain and not being a Latin learned scholar, being a mere historian, a European historian of the um, modern period and two, two fields in, in medieval. Uh, I wanted to know more about this John of St. Thomas Poinceau. So this was a very interesting beginning. And then that was the end of that conference. And the next I hear, months go by and, and um, John Dealey writes to me out of the blue, phones me as a matter of fact, and invites me to the, the third annual conference, the Semiotic Society of America. Semiotic Society of America. Well, I don't know anything about semiotics. I have an interdisciplinary, for want of a better word, transdisciplinary perspective, being an historian. We historians do have that. Uh, but I don't know what he's talking about. And he says, just, just go. And I said, all right. And then the program arrives. Oh, my God. I read the program, you know, Dietschy signs, Swati sign. What in the world is all of this about? Well, this is Charles Sanders' purse and so forth. I don't know any of this. Why does he want me to come to this conference? I don't want to waste the University of Delaware um, funding. I was in the University of Delaware honors program. And I said to John, I don't understand the program. And he said, you have to go in person to find out what semiotics is about. Well, you know, John can be quite insistent on this. You know, you know his method, you know his style, inviting people, whoever they, whatever walks of life. So I show up. That's where I meet Thomas A. Sibiak for the first time. Don't know anything yet about semiotics. And <laughs> how do I find out? Thomas A. Sibiak sees me in the lobby and wonders what an comes up to me and says, What's it? What is your field? I said, History. He said, What's an historian doing here? And I say, <laughs> I didn't want to tell him that's what I was wondering myself. Uh, but I said, I'm here to find out about semiotics. What's your field? I said. I'm Thomas A. Sylvia. It sort of goes from there. And I don't understand anything. I go to the book exhibit. Well, Nathan Hauser was there at the book exhibit. And I said, I need an introduction to semiotics. And he said, there is none. He said, you can see <laughs> there is no introduction to semiotics written yet. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can start with uh, Charles Sanders' purse. I pick up a, a volume, I don't understand anything. I said, no, I don't understand this. Well, then try Umberto Eco here. So I said, oh, well, now I get it, you know, code and everything. I, I could kind of relate to this. Yeah, Umberto Eco, that's okay. That's good. Then in walks John Dealey. And I say, I'm still confused about semiotics. He says, oh, you have to start with Poinceau. Juan Poinceau, Portuguese philosopher. Get it? I got to start with Jean Poinceau. Yeah, the distinction between mind dependent and mind independent. Um, relations and so forth and so on. Uh, and I'm thinking, hmm, I don't get it. So I go to the plenary session on that third annual, started October 3rd, the plenary session that night, Sibiot spoke on the logic of abduction, Sherlock Holmes. That all rang a bell. Now I was on home ground, okay? And I've been in semiotics ever since. Now, Later in the conference, I, I said, I need to, okay, I need to understand more about uh, John of St. Thomas. John and I had a private conversation. He said, all right, I'll tell you how to start. I have the manuscript on, it's this tall. And I can show you the manuscript on Poisson. And so we spent a few hours on his manuscript, talking about his manuscript on Poisson, just a private conversation. Next thing I know, he takes out his red pen and he starts adding Latin footnotes. Well, it's beyond me, but I said, he certainly does love his footnotes. That I learned first of all. He certainly does love his footnotes. I was impressed with that. And then he turns to me and then says, what, what, what about your life? You know, and I, I tell him a few things about sports and, and so forth. He says, oh, well, uh, when, when I was in high school, I, um, you know, I was on, the, the high school football team. And I thought, here we go again, you know, been here, done that with men. And he, then he added, and whenever I suited up, the team lost. And I thought, voila, 
I thought, here is a man that doesn't have to prove his masculinity. And then, uh, and then he said, all right, well, it's time to go now. Um, and at the end of the conference, he presented me with his manuscript, Poinceau. He said, would you copy it at this? My introduction to semiotics before he wrote introducing semiotics. Would I copy edit this bilingual text? Yes, indeed. Including the grammatical structure, of course. That's another story for another time. So that was my introduction. Now, where we came from at the Jacques Maritain conference to begin with in heart and soul is, is really, has been the inspiration for both of us in our life and in our marriage, in our relationship, the relation that goes beyond just the physical relation into the present tense of, the, of our relation. Here, here are Jacques Maritain, now in his 90s. He has only a few months to go. And the young John Dealey, who is presenting to Maritain his first book, The Tradition via Heidegger, his first book dedicated to Jacques and Raisa Maritain. And you can see Jacques expression um, with this young American, uh, deeply, deeply fond of John. So it, it goes on from there. And now I turn to Brazil. I, I'm going to, how do I put it? Um, jump from the past to the present to the future and so forth. I'm not being chronological about this. When, when John was a Fulbright professor in Brazil, hmm, that was something else again. He didn't know any Portuguese. Uh, and it was such a lived experience. I can't really express be the beauty of it all. We became very close to our host, who was Junia Alves. I'm still very close to her to this day. And Junia, um, we'd had a lot of fun making fun of John's Portuguese, which sounded to, to Junia like Tarzan. In fact, everywhere we gathered, because John was so confident in the way he used words and sometimes very inappropriately and didn't know it. And sometimes people were very uh, disconcerted. He said the wrong thing, which was really um, off color, but he didn't know it. And then it became hilarious, you see what I'm saying? So uh, years later, uh, jumping ahead now, going from the past to the present, the future and so forth, years later, uh, John chooses, Junior to introduce him at the 2008 annual uh, meeting of the Semiotic Society of America, 23 countries gathered and Junior <laughs> spoofs, you know, in her introduction about, about John, uh, you spoke Portuguese as he learned it, little by, I was gonna say poco, poco, little by little as he learned it in the streets of, of, of Brazil. He, and we both learned it that way, really. He, just a moment. Bruno is walking around, just a minute. Let him, the doggy doggy here. She said, John, you spoke Portuguese with such confidence and you had no reason for such confidence. And so that's kind of the, atmosphere that I want to give is this is a young man. We start out with his youth now, back, tracing him back to his youth. Um, a young man, did he always have such confidence? Well, I don't know. You can, you can read the history and see yourself for yourself, young students. But I'm talking to students, to all of you all over the world, where, whoever you are, whatever your field, whether you're even in academics or not, that kind of inner vocation to say what you have in you to say, no matter what with a intellectual or whatever, with a humility, beginning with humility, no matter what the outcome, John had humility intellectually. This has been shown over and over again in, in, in writing and in commentary. He was not interested in his name and for his namesake. In fact, when he was a young man and co-authored a book with Mortimer Adler and they disagreed on one small point, Adler thought it was, turned out to be the whole of John's own angle on philosophy and the rewriting of history the history of philosophy in relation to the sign. All right, so he always had, he, he when Adler said, this is co-published, so 
this is the way it's going to go to press. He said, John said, then I would draw my name from the publication as a, as a young author. And he and Adler, um, Adler accepted that in the long run and respected it and so forth and so on. But that's John. And I think it's an important point that, that whoever you are, whether you be Teresa of Avila, uh, for example, during the Spanish Inquisition, saying what in you what you have to say and never mind the critics, okay? Let's see here. I can find that one. first book. The, well, the, the, oh, well, we're going back further in history. Um, good enough. Good enough. Oh, while well, we're at it, because you know I'm a bit what? Um, going between the past and the future and so forth. This is random here. Basics of semiotics. John did write this in Brazil. This is pretty fundamental. <laughs> Semiotica Basica in Brazil, something like uh, 12 languages been translated into something like nine editions. I can't keep track, but the, the point is he did write this in, in Brazil. Now, going back to his past about where this confidence come from on this young man and our, any of us at any age, whatever be our field, we're talking about a vocation, a distinction between a job, a career, and a vocation from within. Well, this young man, the Dominicans found him on the street, so to speak, of Albuquerque. He didn't have money to go to college. And uh, he, he, the Dominicans took him in as a novice and so forth for, with a lifelong relationship with John Dealey. Um, they became like family members to us and so forth. The young John Dealey, very handsome. Uh, this is the same age as when he wrote to his spiritual director that he didn't think that he could uh, continue um, with the Dominicans or with, the, with even graduating from Loris College for a BA degree because he was sure he would not be able to pass the Latin test, the exam in Latin. And the Dominicans insisted you take Latin <laughs> so there's a lot of correspondence, and I've published on that too. Um, right here, you can read about it in the American Journal of Semiotics. This is from the archives. No, the world hadn't heard about any of that until 2017, 2018. This came out. So here's this. Here's this young scholar. Then we know the yet. We know the result. We know the result. He, he, as you can imagine. He did pass the Latin exam and par excellence he went from there. So I'm simply saying that at any age, at any time, whatever we're in, we, we can hit these roadblocks and we can reach deep down with the discipline to do what we have within us to say. All right, now let's see, moving forward in time. How many years did it take to publish this first edition of the semiotic of the of, of the Tractatus de Signis, the semiotic of John Poinçot, Juan Poinçot in Portuguese. 16, bilingual, never been done, but I won't even go into it because I don't need to. There's history behind us. The second edition, put out by Augustine Press, St. Augustine Press, Tractatus de Signis, and so forth. So, 16 years in the making, and it came about. Now, Umberto Eco didn't, didn't think it would come out that soon. Umberto Eco has a cartoon. Well, uh, actually, it's right here. I mean, if you can see it, I don't know, but there's this cartoon at John's grave site. And, hmm. No, you can't. Okay, cartoon at the grave site. Here's John's grave tombstone. And today, gentlemen, we are celebrating the beginning of the fifth millennium AD with the publication of the expected and coveted Tractatus de Cygnus. And these gentlemen, these gentlemen have space suits on. So if we're good thinking now in your lifetime about the fifth century, the fifth century, the millennium to come, what we can have an influence on what you're doing right now with our world. I really think that that's an insight of John's 
the influence of the future on the on the past, what you have within you and potential to say and do in the world that you're in right now, I think it's, it's, a, it's something that uh, to be duly weighed and, and, and pondered and your own life. Now, John went to Mexico as a Fulbright too. Well, that's another story. Come to think of it, that story about uh, where he said, I have an angle in the rewriting of philosophy. Remember, you got an angle, you have your own voice. How are you going to do that? It's already been all done, said this woman. Well, this woman happened to be a nun in the Hispanic uh, ministry there. None of these Hispanics knew English very well, believe me. I was with them for a long time and just enjoyed and loved being in that being together with them. And John was at a church picnic with us. You and he was such at home, so at home with the, the Mexicans on the street. So at home, the ones with, without electricity, the ones without running water or anything. And when we were in Mexico, he really bonded with the Mexican people to the point of uh, our finally rescuing one of the Mexican dogs there for a family that became our own dog. And uh, here, here's this dog while John writes his opus, Four Ages of Understanding in Mexico. So. This story of mine will probably end up this, this talk uh, where it goes to the dogs. Here we're talking about the relation between between the human being, the relation of the human being is part of nature. Distinct from, na distinct from other animals, animals other than human, in that we transmit and transform our culture through language. Yet at the same time, part of nature in the transcendent sense of love, love divine that actually is more mystical in the sense of, of transcending all that philosophy. John himself uh, defined himself strictly as a philosopher so as not to get into that, ooh, ooh, mystical theology, which is a realm of unknown mode of knowing through love and you can't, uh, you, philosophy can only go so far, so can theology. This transcendent love is what we're talking about. And that's really my message. I think it's the message of John, the, 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 the trans, and in love, and you could see this, you could see this to, to, to his last days and in his relationship with Bruno. Now, to go back and forth in the spiral of semiosis, because I'm not being linear here, here comes the book, Realism for the 21st Century, The John Daly Reader. Wow. <whistles> I'm not gonna say anything about the book. I'm gonna say what John said about the book to me. When the book, what he said about this book to me, Paul Colby, edited by Paul Colby, he said, I don't think I could have done better with the selection of these essays. And to my delight, he did choose that handsome picture of John when he was a young man uh, with the Dominicans when he did not know whether or not he would pass the Latin exam. Now, we have more recently, 2020, Medieval Philosophy Redefined as a Latin Age, again, published by Augustan Press. And you can go from there on that. This business about redefining, okay, of the Latin Age, how do we, how, how do we define our own age? Is it simply postmodern? Is it transmodern? Or is it, we, how do we name an age? We don't know in the fifth century AD what this age will be named. We are very sensitive in this age as an age of relation, the whole concept of our being in relation to nature and what does this really mean? This whole business about the sign is a super, super subjective relation between mind dependent and mind independent or mind, or, or mind awareness or rather uh, what we're aware of or what we're not aware of, how it comes into relation. This is, this is where we are now at this point in history. However, it develops between you people, but however you, you develop your own thinking, it is about relation and you don't even have to be an academic to do it. Both Siebiak and, 
and John, uh, all people, all walks of life, whatever your field, go for it. So voila, I wish you the best. Thank you. Winto obrigada. Un momento, un momento, un momento. The most essential is this. Bruno, I talk about, it's off already. Oh, good. This little dog, Bruno, made international press because when John was, a, was in his dying days, his brother asked him, whom do you want for a eulogist? And John said, no one. Now, this is perfectly typical of John Bealey, not wanting any fuss about him. Well, his brother said, you have to have somebody. Who's it going to be? And he chose Bruno. Now, we have had three rescue dogs, the one from Mexico. Beethoven. Choho, cachojo, cachojo. That's Portuguese for dog. And that doesn't mean puppy is in Spanish, cachojo. The, what is dog? Our first dog was named Cachojo. And I leave it, I leave it to you to, to say John's fidelity and love and devotion to these rescue dogs and he rescued a cat, so forth and so on, uh, opens up the, the talk. I lived with it, through it with him, believe me. The inner John Dealey. <laughs> As far as he's concerned, his work, we could go to the dogs by comparison with his love for these dogs. In fact, if any of you know John Dealey, he's very fussy about how you open a book. He must be very careful about each page and the, how you treat the spine and so forth and so on before you even read it or anything like this. Well, one day, Kishoho, this puppy from the, the, the rescue puppy, chewed off the cover of his favorite book on Aristotle. How am I going to tell John this, you know? So he says, show me. I said, she, she, dam she really damaged your book on Aristotle. Bring it to me. I brought it to him. His response, oh, she didn't do much damage. Well, for now, God bless you. Dear Dr. Brooke williams Dilly, thank you so much for being with us today and for your speech full of inspiration and spirit and full of precious testimony. We are so excited to have you here today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Matthew Meinart uh, from American Maritime Association. Okay, am I good with my voice here? All right, good. Uh, just new microphone, I wanna make sure it's working fine. So I'm gonna be looking up this way to look at my other monitor because I have my remarks pre-written. Uh, hopefully the length is fine. I'm speaking both on behalf of the American Maritime Association and a little bit on behalf of myself and Brooke in a way, because Brooke and I talked uh, about a week and a half ago, just about the comments I'm gonna make about the end of John's life, which I was blessed to be very close to in those last days. But let me just go ahead and jump in and just come through my, my talk. Um, but I, I would like to, on behalf of the American Maritime Association and myself, uh, thank all of those who've been involved with the University of Coimbra and the Lyceum Institute and other institutions, and especially Dr. Junquera and Passerini, apologies uh, for pronunciation, uh, for this year's five-year remembrance of the life and work of John. How auspicious it is uh, these coming months, how auspicious they promise to be, having drawn together such high caliber scholars to continue the work of our shared master. And so I'm looking forward to the talks that are scheduled and I hope more will be added. I know I'm, I'm gonna add one little more talk and I'm sure others will too. So I, I really think this will be a great um, set of events for the public and I look forward to it. But today is not time for intellectual work so much as for heartfelt remembrance of our dear John. Kindly allow me to prevent, uh, present 
to you a few remarks, uh, first on behalf of the Maritime Association here in America, whom I represent, and then on, be on my own behalf, having been blessed to share some small part in John's last days on earth. In the theological matters of the divine indwelling of the Trinity, the scholastics, inc including John's great master, Poinceau, speak of the distinction between the presence of immensity, which is how God is present as cause to his effects, whether in nature or grace, and then the, what we could call the flowering of that presence, the indwelling of friendship that takes place through knowledge and love. We might call these existential physical presence and friendship presence. Those members of the American Maritime Association who knew John for decades have become, become keenly aware these past five years that the presence of friendship truly requires the existential and physical presence of the person who is beloved in order for friendship to truly be itself. Thus, uh, lest I be tempted perhaps to tears before even my own remarks at the end, let's lightheartedly say that those who knew John these many years miss his immensity. So there's your Thomas joke for the morning. But above all, this is, yes, the immensity of his uh, large personality. Uh, some would say maybe bombastic uh, and full of an intense devotion to the, tr to the truth as well. But also, too, we miss the immensity of his mind present among us, which in the, in the opinion of no few of us scholastics holds the promise for a renewed Thomism at once vitally in touch with its long history, while also ready to press forward into new problematics to confront metaphysical, and I would say also theological uh, problems that are sometimes overlooked by kind of blinkered, to use a phrase quite dear to John, rear view mirror, Thomism. But how greatly uh, in this regard is his immense, immense presence and friendship also keenly felt by his less seasoned colleagues. How melancholy it has been for us to lose a man who many of us wish would be our own teacher for many years to come. His reading of the tradition, quite revolutionary and yet also steeped in the great history of scholastic thought, requires lengthy apprenticeship to appreciate, and therefore we all stand at a profound loss, for books are but the relics of the vital illumination of cognition, and how much greater would it have been to be in his presence for some years, illuminated uh, by the reflection of an intellect higher than our own, somewhat like the angels spoken of by the Thomists. Loftier angels sometimes merely illuminating lower ones through the exercising of the former's power of knowing and loving, kind of light for the dimmer angelic mind. That's a John Dealey sentence. I just realized that. And I should look at the, the length of that. I, I like to break sentences up. I don't like John's approach. But this will be printed out and maybe a little bit easier to follow. My apologies. Sentences, I'll break them up as I go along if I need to. And how much more did we younger scholars need the object of semiotics to be proposed to our lesser lights? Um, he had, yes, full, uh, the full capacity of, of knowing uh, semiotic Thomism, but we stood in need and, and stand in need of his, uh, of his wisdom in this regard. Uh, and then I'm going to skip one thing to go right, and then we'll just finish out through the Maritime Association and my remarks. Uh, let me convey on behalf of Dr. James Hannock of the American Mar Maritime Association, its president and longtime friend of John, um, his, his remarks. I asked him earlier this week to provide just some brief remarks too on behalf of those who knew John and founded the American Maritime Association along with him. So uh, James asked me, Dr. Hannock uh, asked me to communicate this. The American Maritime Association treasures John Dealey's long and fruitful presence in our midst. We terribly miss his sparkle and erudition. We are the beneficiaries of his mission that we fully grasp the prescience of Jacques Maritain's own creative Thomism. When John first took us in hand, some of us were not cognizant yet of the dif difference between probiotics and semiotics. This is a Jim Hannock kind of joke, I assure you. John was guilty of doing that with him as well. Uh, but Jim then finished, today we are thankful for his tutelage and we join you in honoring his now international legacy. And in my words, Vishnai Pamyat, eternal memory and blessed repose. May he rest in peace. Now, turning to my own personal recollections, again, allow me to, let me thank all of you just to share a few personal reminiscences from John's last days. I 
spoke to Brooke about this and she was both comfortable with me doing it and thankful that she could provide a positive and uplifting message and mine will be too, but it's going to remember those, those painful last months, uh, but with really a, a, an appreciation for the blessing of knowing John then. By the happy chance uh, that we Christians feel duty bound to recognize as the hand of Providence, I found myself living in southwestern Pennsylvania during the same time as John's last days on earth. I'd moved back in the area to live closer to my then fiance and now wife. I was at the time at the very end of my doctoral work at the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC, and was teaching also in a night school program at, the small, at a small college in Maryland, though I had uh, a lot of extra time uh, for writing my dissertation and, and whatnot, I was quite flexible. I had some ties with St. Vincent College and therefore uh, had, the pres- uh, had heard about the presence of John Dealey there. Um, bit surprising given that I had known his long affiliation with the University of St. Thomas. Um, And since I lived about an hour from the college and the Arch Abbey, it seemed maybe a potentially wonderful opportunity to get to know a man who, unbeknownst to him, had really had an immense influence on me during my formative years in graduate studies. I, I don't even remember how I stumbled onto his work. It was some comment that was made in passing by Robert Sokolowski, uh, Monsignor Sokolowski, at around the same time that I had run across one of John's books. And so just sort of the two events connected it, and I just devoured the stuff and then found a colleague, uh, a fellow graduate student, who had himself stumbled on this by different paths all through, through, through Maritan, actually. Um, and we were just taken by it. So here he was close, close by in Western Pennsylvania. I thought this was just such a neat thing. But while I'm an extrovert by temperament, I, I don't like to be a, a brown noser. And so I contacted John when he was moving. I had to go back and look at the emails to try and remember this exactly. I did contact him and say, you know, if you need anything when you're coming to Pennsylvania, be, be willing to reach out to me, but I'm sure St. Vincent will be helping you. But I didn't want to be pushy seemed best to leave things unfold in due course. But alas, I did hear, it's pretty soon there after their move, uh, from St. Saint, Saint Vincent's Dr. George Liner, uh, that John's health had taken a fateful turn doing, due to uh, the underlying sickness that ultimately took his life. As I recall today, I had heard tell of one of his earlier strokes, strokes, though it seemed at the time that recovery was going to be possible. I even recall the Maritan Association meeting in New York uh, with him present, sparring pun for pun with Jim Hannock, as though they could talk puns as their language. So in light of this news from George, uh, I thought it best to reach out to Brooke. Uh, I couldn't find the exact correspondence. I might have mailed it, actually, just to offer her any aid that she might need um, or, you know, not, not offer it if she didn't need it during this dread moment in her life. Uh, But this communication actually marked the beginning of really a blessed period uh, when I would visit John weekly, maybe even sometimes a little bit more than weekly, because my wife was actually teaching uh, two courses as an adjunct at St. Vincent and then working in private practice as a psychologist at the time in in Greensburg, just over from Latrobe. So I'd drive her to Latrobe and attend the liturgies at the monastery with her. Uh, and then uh, I'd go to the Dealey residence while she was teaching, and then I would take her to her office, and I'd go off and do my writing at a coffee shop. And the time with John was really at once, of course, both blessed and tragic. The physical and psychological effects of his strokes were evident, but in a way intermittently. But Brooke and I realized pretty quickly, and this is why I kept doing it, I wouldn't have imposed otherwise, um, the good that it did him just to have someone else in the house, probably, you know, I hope, Brooke, it was just some small relief to have one other set of eyes in the house. I know what it's like to care for folks at the end of life. And you really had a, a heavy cross then. Um, and it was, you know, just, I think, it gladdened John to have a young scholar for him to hold court to, um, you know, and, and talk matters metaphysical and semiotics for a little bit, just as a, a change of pace. Um But our dear John, who, as we noted, yes, he was immense after all in his personality, managed to arrive, uh, remain alive much longer than we thought he would. Um, So during this time, I helped a little bit here and there with some of the the affairs of St. Vincent, kind of just on his side. And we just kept having these weekly meetings, sometimes productive, one might say, uh, sometimes, you know, wandering about his books in the basement, but just letting him the whole court. um, And, you know, it's it's a, a service as a Christian to be present to Christ and those who are ill, but it's like a double service uh, of filial piety to be able to be with your intellectual master during those days and just try to give some small, you know, comfort. 
to be with Christ the suffering in the guise of the man who really had so reoriented my thought. This was a great joy and honor. Um, and I look back, therefore, on the, the years of uh, time of 2016, just with, you know, great warmth, uh, perhaps partly because my kids hadn't come along. So life was a little bit simpler. Uh, but of course, to be at the side of my master during his last days on this mortal coil. But at the beginning of January or the end of 2016 and then January 2017, as we know, things took a turn for the worst. And poor Brooke, who bore so much of the sorrow and difficulty of his daily care, um, which we should always remember just with a fond um, love for Brooke, uh, the care she showed for John during those many months. It's a very difficult thing to do, anyone who's cared for someone at the end of life. Um, she now, though, found herself faced with that other hard decision to move someone into care, which is just this, it's like cross upon cross upon cross at the end of life. And she bore it with such grace and such love because she could no longer provide care uh, for him, you know, at the house, even with the help of helpers. By chance, the Westmoreland Manor, the location was, was right along the way that my wife would drive to the office. And so I, I recall at least visiting him a couple times in 2017, um, as we passed by, but the events kind of blur together. Um, it's all a little bit surreal because I just never would have thought when I moved back that I would be, you know, spending this kind of time close to John and his passing, right? Um, holding the the hand of of the somewhat bombastic John Dealey, you know, as he lay there, um, you know, dis in discomfort, you know, in his last days. Uh, so I don't remember on the 7th um, what brought me to go over to Westmoreland Manor again. Um, I don't know if I had planned it or not. It was a Saturday. I had to go back and look, but I thought I recalled it being a Saturday. And I would go with my wife sometimes on a Saturday to work so that we could maybe, you know, do something as an outing because uh, we live in a rural area. So uh, Greensburg seems like a city compared to where we live. Um, and so I ended up, after dropping her off, going over to Westmoreland Manor. And John was quite weak that, that morning. And poor Brooke was, of course, so worn down from the back and forth of coming between Latrobe and there um, on top of all the care for him. And, you know, his, his breathing at, the, at that point was, of course, quite soft. Mm -hmm. And she and I were waiting, actually, for the uh, coming of his sister, Rita, who was in town visiting him. Um, and as anyone knows who's cared for someone at the end of life, there's so little that one can do. You just wait with a loving and, and you know, spousal and friendly presence. Um, here, physical presence is really the solitary bearer of uh, the intellectual and spousal friendship that we feel for our, our beloved. Rita arrived soon thereafterwards, and after some brief words, uh, she went to her brother with with us. Uh, she went to her brother's bedside, and it was as though he knew he could die. He heard her voice and passed away. Um, uh, it was just you know quite a both moving and surprising moment. After his passing, some of the initial grieving and some of those initial conversations that happen when you're in a facility like that. I thought it best to leave Rita and Brooke to handle, of course, the affairs. And I can't recall, but I'm sure that um, I'm sure that um, his his brother Bill was somewhere involved as well. And I thought, well, it, whatever you need in Latrobe, I'll be more than happy to get. But you know, I, I think that you know you need your your space. Um, you know, especially Rita didn't know me all that well, so I just didn't want to be overbearing that way. It wasn't my place to impose on the solemn moment there. So I went with my way and I assure you I'm moving toward the end here. I, I went on my way to the White Rabbit, that coffee shop I'd worked at so often. And as I walked in, it's like one of these moments of providence, there was George Liner. Uh, and I was still a bit stunned. So I, I, I recall it being awkward. He was sitting at this table. And uh, if I remember correctly, he actually asked me, oh, how's John? And I said, he passed away. And I remember him being shocked. He, he expressed heartfelt grief. Um, and I can assure you that um, his his continued advocacy on John's behalf at St. Vincent really bears witness to the truth of this expression. I think it's important to make the remark here that this man, uh, George, uh, who never really had any reason philosophically nor personally to have any devotion to John's work, to be honest. Um, John was sort of uh, just uh, new to the new to the. Uh, philosophy faculty there at St. Vincent. He was really kind of brought in through the seminary um, and semiotics meant nothing to, to uh, George. 
who nonetheless really is um, no detriment to other people meant here. Uh, the primary reason I would say for the successful outcome though of the establishment of things at St. Vincent, because he was so insistent, you need someone on the ground. And George was very devoted. And George and I are very philosophically different, temperamentally different, but I think very highly of him as a human being. And I, I think that all of us owe a debt of gratitude to him for the continuance of this. And so just as a, a remark in public that we all here together owe a debt of filial piety to him. And while I won't note anyone else, I do think it's appropriate, not merely because he's here, because the person who's taken over, though, that sort of same on the ground role, who should be recognized, um, in addition to someone like um, Brother Norman Hips, who's present, is Joseph de Chichis, who has been incredibly devoted to Brooke in, in her move and in the continued sort of acting out of things on the ground. And so I think we should you know, make sure we always recognize the debt that we all owe. But then things unfolded like they always do at the end of life, funerals, remembrances, and most of all for Brooke, right, the silent loneliness that follows after death. Everyone else goes back to life, and there you are with a hole left in your heart, especially a hole the size of someone you loved and with whom you shared your substance for all of these decades. With great devotion, uh, she made sure that all the stages were set for securing and guaranteeing John's legacy, often doing so at the cost of great psychological uh, exertion in those, those days of grief, uh, and nonetheless just pushing along. Uh, all of this was done by a woman who loved him more than any of us could. And for that reason, it's therefore with these last words, I wish to recall to the attention of all of you here, we've already heard her speak, of course, but to appreciate present here, this widow, a woman now five years belonging to that class of people, who draws the love of the Most High in a particular way, our dear Brooke Dealey. If today we celebrate the life of John Dealey, let us celebrate too, while she is still alive in our midst, this echo of John's life among us. Today, Brooke, we recognize all, all that you have been for John and all the debt that we personally owe to you because of John's own life. You, faithful spouse and collaborator of our shared master, no Hialeta, may God grant you many blessed and peaceful years. Let us end there with our minds and hearts set on Brooke, full of filial devotion and ready to assure her that we are dedicated to seeing her husband's work bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. Thank you all of you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Minard. Um, that was great. I, I'm, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Barana Baker, and let's hear what she has to say. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, yes. fantastic. Okay. Um, yeah, I just, I spoke to Brooke a few days ago, uh, wondering whether what I was thinking about going into with uh, my relationship with John and a story therein would be appropriate for this uh, forum. And she felt it would. And I think we sort of both jump started each other into, um, into wanting to give forth a personal testimony to who John had been in our lives. Um, in my mid forties, I uh, was, finishing up my bachelor's degree after a long drawn out process. And um, I was at the University of St. Thomas and had to take a medieval history class in order to graduate. It was my very last semester and the one that was offered was by Dr. John Dealey. Um, I checked into his reputation and was really quite excited to be taking it from him because he um, was known to be a difficult professor. And at that point, I, with the double major, double minor and years under my belt of undergrad work, uh, was bored. So I thought, well, good, this won't be boring. So I signed up and I showed up. And the very first day of class, um, here comes Dr. Dealey in his sort of leisure coat, walking up to the podium and beginning to speak on the history of the sign. And myself and about maybe 18 other students sat there somewhat mystified for over an hour, trying to figure out what any of this had to do with medieval philosophy whatsoever. 
uh, by the end of the class, we were not that much more illuminated and everybody sort of went away mystified with a very large tome, literally about this thick of Xeroxed copies and plastic bound uh, book that John was working on and wanted us to read for this class called um, Medieval History Redefined. Um, and so class proceeded, I read it, started getting more and more into this idea of a sign and what that might be, um, and proceeded to just grill him every class, uh, along with my classmate, Margaret, who I, who I saw uh, was up here earlier. And um, we were older students, so I think we maybe took things a bit more seriously. And a relationship sort of developed between Margaret and John and I, in which um, it was this just sort of a little tete-a-tete that happened. And I fell, in retrospect, I feel very, very fortunate to have gotten to uh, study so intimately with him in a small college setting in a classroom where most of the students weren't really there for anything but the credit. So really great, great introduction to John and the concept of the sign and this book on medieval history, uh, medieval history of philosophy. And so I, um, I was plowing through the tome, the book, and was finding it incredibly difficult to read because I, I'm an editor now. I'm the editor for the Semiotic Society of America. And I have a very hard time reading things that aren't properly punctuated. <laughs> and so I, um, I started red pinning the book in order to make sense of these incredibly long sentences I was encountering, uh, run-ons, I would have called them. But um, so anyway, the class proceeds and all of this is going on and it's truly the most difficult class I've ever taken. And it comes time for the final. And I asked John, you know, raise my hand, what will be the final beyond Professor Dealey? And he said, just memorize the book and you'll be fine. And I went, okay, great. I thought about that and then after class, I approached him and I said, Professor Dealey, um, I wanted to let you see, uh, first of all, this has been a fantastic experience, but I wanted to let you see uh, what I have been doing in order to uh, read your book properly. And I opened my copy with red marks everywhere and he started laughing. And I said, I would love to copy edit this for you. And he said, well, what would you want for it? And I said, well, I, I would want to not have to take the final. And he said, it's a deal. And that began a series. Uh, we proceeded immediately to his home office where I met Brooke and started going through my red notes. And um, next day I brought my brand new uh, baby uh, bull mastiff with me. And we hunkered in for a full day's worth of work. Bruno, who you met in Brooke's uh, speech, uh, had real issues with uh, Julius, my bull mastiff, who was really about that big at the time and ended up weighing 125 pounds. And I remember John telling Bruno, Bruno, you better watch it. He'll be able to eat you alive one day. And so, um, so anyway, we get, we get through all of this and what comes from it is this beautiful friendship that starts with John and Brooke and me moving into the choice of taking a master's at St. Thomas and studying semiotics with him and um, the amazing journey that all of that started my life on. Um, but the thing I think I would like everyone to know the most about John is just his, his sense of humanity on top of all the great intellect that we associate him with. Um, that is what I took away from my years of knowing him, humanity, 
humor, um, a deep, deep love for life and the people he put, chose to put in his. Um, years later, I asked him one evening after um, uh, uh, dinner at his house. So John, what was on that, that final I didn't have to take? And he started laughing and he said, I, I asked him to uh, recreate the, um, uh, the uh, contents, the contents, the title of contents of the book, um, word for word. And I said, did anybody pass? And he said, oh, everybody passed. So, so that was the way I got to know John and uh, was lucky enough to be with him for a good over a decade, I guess, before the last visit I paid to the trobe in which I got to bid him farewell. Um, I am so thrilled and pleased and honored to have been asked to speak briefly about him. I know there are others, so I'm going to keep my comments brief. I am so thrilled that this conference has been pulled together by a vital body of students and is proceeding forward in these crazy times of not being able to reach out and touch anybody. And I am so thrilled that his legacy is being continued and honored today. So thanks guys. Thank you very much, Dr. Baker. And uh, I would like to uh, invite now Dr. Brian Campbell, the Sayum Institute. Yes, uh, thank you, Yulia, and thank you everyone else for, for being here. Um, I will keep my remarks uh, fairly brief as, as I actually, I'm still recovering from the cause of our crazy times, that is uh, uh, COVID. Um, but, you know, there's there's many thoughts that that have occurred to me over this past hour of these as we have uh, recalled John's life and and his influence, and I think of uh, some of the first times that I I had encountering him, uh, some of the first uh, days that we we spent together, those long days of hunkering down, as Barana mentioned, any time that he had a project on which you were going to to help him or which he was going to help you. Uh, many, many days spent uh, in breakfast as we worked on my dissertation and he gave me advice and, and sound criticism uh, where he thinks where he thought that I had, had had perhaps strayed off the path or gone off the rails as he liked to write on the copies of my my text that I gave to him. Um, <clears throat> but really what um, strikes me most of all is is thinking about his his, personality and his personality as, as unflinchingly believing in everything that he believed in, that he was always advocating for the things that he believed in, always advocating for the importance of, of semiotics, the importance of the tradition, the importance of Thomas Aquinas and the importance of John Ponso especially, and that no matter what ad adversity or hesitance there was given in uh, against him and against the things that he was he was proposing, he was he was truly unflinching in trying to get others to see what he had seen himself. And so it's I think a, a, a wonderful thing um, that we're all here together, remembering him, but also uh, advancing his his thought, advancing his insights, uh, bringing this this incredible scope of talent uh, of uh, the institutions involved in this seminar to retrieve historically uh, the, the works of, of scholasticism, of scholastic realism, of all the tradition of philosophy, and to incorporate this in really the advance of semiotics, in advance of, of an understanding of these issues uh, such as relation or the irreducible triadicity of the sign, uh, these questions, these struggles over issues like physiosemiosis, um, I think that what, we'll, we'll, what we will accomplish over this next year will be um, nothing short of, of monumental, uh, nothing short of, of living up to the monumental personality and, and wisdom and insight that uh, John brought to so many of us. And so one other thing that, that struck me as, as Brooke was speaking earlier was this ability that semiotics has and that John himself personified 
of transcending many of these these divisions of thought and and you know opinion to really always seeking out the truth and and to trying to have uh, truth as the center and the goal of all the things that we're doing, uh, regardless of of whom it might favor or whose opinions it might align with, the the truth is what really matters. And so uh, I'm you know I'll just say that I'm I'm quite delighted uh, to be. Uh, participating in this to provide uh, support through the Lyceum Institute for this um, to really uh, what I what I see is will hopefully be a watershed moment in this postmodern age this genuinely moving past modernity and entering into the way of signs um, we have a moment here we have a moment that we can all uh, participate in and contribute to and so I just want to thank everyone for, for your, your investment in this, this process. And uh, thank you. And I look forward to, to this year to come. So. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Kempel. And at this time, I'm going to bring on Dr. Farouk Saif. Thank you, Tim. <clears throat> everyone, can you hear me? Okay. Hello, everyone. And uh, I want to thank William and Robert for their wonderful efforts in putting together this significant event. I am happy to see many friends and colleagues, and I am especially delighted to see my dear friend, Brooke. You are a role model of perseverance and devotion. Thank you, Brooke, for being in our life. As many, uh, many of you uh, know that today uh, is my Coptic Orthodox Christmas. Uh, I'm sure that many of you heard that. Since January 7, 2017, when John Dealey departed our world, to another world, Christmas has never been the same. For me, it is time for contemplative reflection on the irony of celebrating the birth of Christ while experiencing the sadness of John's passing. John was a dear friend, not just a colleague. To pay a tribute to John on the fifth anniversary of his passing is really to reinterpret his death as rebirth, his death as rebirth, to keep his memory alive. And to keep Dili's memory alive is to continue dialoguing with him through extens his extensive and inspiring work. I am going to limit my comment to this. I have said many things in many articles and two, at least three videos that actually been uh, uh, on the website. Uh, one is actually, is, uh, the last one was interview with William that uh, was really remarkable questions that came from William. That was on November 29th, 2021. And another one that was actually uh, was on at the St. Vincent College. And that was the title, Who is John Dealey? Not Who was John Dealey? And the, prior to that, there was a remarkable, actually, uh, article and video that I am honored and delighted to have been part of it. And it's called Imaginary Dialogue with John Dee. So to end this, folks, friends, and colleagues, let us continue our dialogue with John Dee. I am amazed at the amount of work that he has done. When I visited him in Latrobe, just prior to his passing, John told me, I thought I have another few years to write more. And I said to John, 
you have done a lot. You have done more than anyone that I know in my life. The irony is every time I read John's work, I am discovering something that I missed. It is a constant learning from a dear colleague and dear friend that I will never forget. For you, John, my Christmas will never be the same. Farewell, my dear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Saif. Uh, Merry Christmas to you. And uh, I would like to give floor to Dr. Hamid Malekzadeh. Uh, can you hear me properly? Uh, in the text I just uh, prepared for to day, I uh, try to explain the significance and the importance of John Gideon's project for us in, as uh, young uh, scholars in Iran. So uh, in a couple of minutes, I'll just try to read uh, from the text I have prepared. To begin with, I would like to extend a warm welcome on behalf of the Iranian Society for Phenomenology and the Iranian politics uh, and the Iranian, I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry. To begin with, I would like to extend a warm welcome to, on behalf of the Iranian Society for Phenomenology and the Iranian Political Science Association in honoring John Dealey's intellectual work and significance today, we can for our part show our appreciation to the thinker who has made thoughtful contribution to our encounters with ourselves and the world we live in every day. Our affinity with John Dealey and the relation he had both during his lifetime and the years since his passing is a living and ever renewing affinity. Just as it is with any other prominent thinker who has provided new narratives to understand what we human uh, beings experience in our world. In honoring the creative minds who have come up with new ways of coping with ourselves and others in the world, we must also honor the ever present presence in our experience through their hard, uh, honorable works. Thus, in two brief uh, but important ways, I try to explain the significance of John Didi's intellectual work to us at the Iranian Society for Phenomenology and the Iranian Political Science Association. The accounts Didi provides of semiotics in its most basic moments is of great importance for us. In a sense, this importance exists on two levels that, that are not only interconnected, but distinct from one another. First, through our way of think, think, thinking about the fundamental questions we raise concerning our political uh, situation. Additionally, to provide answer to the challenges we face in our political being, which from our standpoint is of the sense of every being of the very being of us, since the term political is essentially tied to the term semiotic animal, which is a way of saying animals surrounded by meanings and the act of science. In both eras, we will examine the fundamental concepts from the new perspective created by Didi. These two eras of participation of Didi's narrative of uh, semiotics in our phenomenological research must be taken into account given the need that we have increasingly identified in Iranian society to formulate an understanding of politics in general and political science in particular. 
As a result of governing dominance of realist narratives about politics in Iranian politics, we are facing a kind of crisis in the Iranian life world, a crisis which along with the rest of the world is produced by the dominance of reductionist narratives on our surrounding world or life world as animals and human animals. The dominance under which our surrounding world has become a subject for objective planning in a Hegelian sense, based on uh, the attic uh, relations, which dietic re relations, which as a result had deformed our way of relating to each other, our history and our surrounding world, or as human animals, that is our, our, our life work. Our efforts towards a kind of uh, restoration of politics or political science by rethinking its foundations can greatly be influenced by, uh, by what John Dealey suggests about the own world, living world, and semiosis. We believe that such a dialogue with Dealey's work in an interdisciplinary way might provide us with a new understanding of our relating to ourselves and to a great extent led us, leads us in, consider, in considering human or non-human animals and the surrounding world in which we live. Applying Didi's specific formulation of concepts I mentioned earlier could also reopen a new dialogue in the Iranian academic uh, community about the university and the work that is envisaged for it. Since the scientific institutions on the subject area of politics from the very beginning of its establishment in Iran have been formed under a strong temptation to be efficient in running the government and are drawing in its temptation more and more. Dili's narrative of the world, meaning and concepts can be very significant for us in before mentioned restoration and somehow in the construction of the Iranian university to find a new way and to bring it back to its proper place. That is from an institutional instrument to prepare appropriate programs to control life in a way that works under the name of development as an external intervention in people's lives to achieve predetermined goals by applying the uh, causal relations to play its fundamental role for us as a, uh, a species living and giving our own specific meaning to our surrounding world. For this reason, our critical dialogue with John Dealey will be a living and very important one, and not of just academic or scientific interest. My colleagues in the Iranian Society for Phenomenology and the Iranian Political Science Association will, as part of our participation in this inter inter international event, uh, appropriately share our specific experiences of their own uh, critical dialogue with the Dili project with our audiences during forthcoming events this year. Thank you for your time again and wish you a very, very good new year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and at this time, uh, I'll open the floor to Dr. Ina Mokolava at the uh, International Center for Semiotics and Intercultural Dialogue, the uh, State Academic University for Humanities in Moscow. Uh, thank you. Um, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers um, for the invitation to take part in this large international online project uh, dedicated to John Dili. This is an important initiative, important because it brings together synergies from different schools 
from around the world. And during this year, 2022, all of us, the project participants, will feel like one big team. I participate in the project as a Russian semiotician, a representative of the Moscow Tartu, Tartu Moscow tradition of semiotics of culture. I'm a Lotmon's translator into French, and we worked a lot with Russian semiotics like Ivanov and Gliva and others. But also, I represent the French semiotic tradition as a student of the semiotician Jacques Montagny and of the linguist and mathematician Jean Pierre Teclay. Therefore, Today, my few words at the opening of uh, the Dili project uh, will be associated with the names of Lodman and Grimes. Remembering the title of Dili's article in Semiotica in 1993, uh, reading the science, some basics of semiotics, I would like to name my speech reading the science, reading the memorable dates. The era in which we live, the 20s of the 21st century is a time of planetary challenges with the health crisis. At the same time, these are years of round anniversaries of major representatives of semiotic community, such as John Dealey with uh, the fifth anniversary of his passing and the 80th anniversary of his arrival, or Umberto Eco, 19th anniversary of birth or Yuri Lotman, centenary of this. This is a reason to turn to the reflections, uh, to the thoughts, to, in order to better comprehend what is happening in connection with the nature of man himself. Memorable dates or anniversaries are themselves a semiotic phenomenon. Uh, semiotics builds a general image of science and that's making the history of human culture. And it is in this sense that today, maybe we should understand the statement of uh, Russian philologist and semiotician Vyacheslav Ivanov. The task of semiotics is to describe the semiosphere, without which the no sphere is un unthinkable. Semiotics should help us navigate history. Therefore, memorable dates, anniversaries of prominent personalities, dates of book or publications, uh, periods of congresses, um, all of this have, uh, as a kind of cultural reference points on which the measurement scale is based. In the UNESCO system, there is a whole program of anniversaries, international dates, days, international decades, etc., aimed at promoting intercultural dialogue and tribute to the memory of outstanding personalities who contributed to the construction of human civilization. Recent examples of UNESCO anniversaries include, for example, the Congress of the French Semiotic Association on the centenary of birth of the founder of the Paris Semiotic School, Argueta Julian Kramers, in 2017. And uh, this uh, last year, 2021, uh, the conference on the centenary of the living French philosopher and sociologist Edgar Morin. The anniversary of Lodman in 2022 was also included in uh, the UNESCO anniversaries program. For this centenary inclusion in this program marks another step towards the international institutionalization of semiotics as a discipline. If uh, from the point of view of European, uh, European colleagues, Semiotics does not need to justify its social or economic benefits, uh, Klinkenberg 2012, then it still needs to be institutionalized uh, at the national and international level, uh, Fontaine 2013. According to the well-known expression of uh, our Russian poet, Sergei Yesenin, the big is seen at a distance. Therefore, the anniversaries of great authors like Dili, like Lotman, um, the anniversaries are a wonderful opportunity to look at their at this text and comprehend what semiotic analysis is. Semiotic analysis, which itself passed the path of evolution in the 20th, 21st centuries. I mean, Lotmanian semiotics of culture, Romassian semiotics of passions, biosemiotics, anthroposemiotics, etc. And in conclusion, I would like to quote Dili and Lotman. 
In the article, Reading the Science, John Dilly wrote about the modern world. A curious thing regarding the life of the mind, every time new foundations are laid for one thing in the present, foundations are laid at the same time for something else that usually is not discovered for several centuries. What I'm thinking of in this case is the marvelous world of the 17th century, which laid the foundation for the modern world, specifically for the bringing in to the center of intellectual concern science. And in his article, Semiotics and Today's World, Yuri Lotman wrote about a related phenomenon. The map of science was redrawn in the 20th century with no less intensity than the geographical one. The traditionally divided spheres merged, forming a combination unsinkable from the point of view of the traditional classification of sciences in the 19th century. Today, man is learning to understand animals, preparing for contacts in space, but he still has to understand himself and those who are next to him to understand what it means to understand in general. Understanding, understanding also means understanding misunderstanding. So it is not coincidence that research on the mechanism of misunderstanding, misinformation, and racial prejudice has emerged. Reading memorable ways as a semiotic phenomenon, trying to understand the phenomenon of understanding, perhaps According to Dilley, this is to lay the foundation for what will be, uh, will be understood and interpreted in many decades. That is to build the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Merkulova. Uh, I would like to give uh, the floor now to Dr. Jamin Pelke, Ryerson University. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm privileged to be here. And um, I'm, I'm also just realizing this morning that it's been 10 years since I met Dealey. Well, it will be when it comes this May. I met, I met John Dealey at a conference organized by the Nordic Association for Semiotic Studies in Lund, Sweden in, in um, May, 2011. And I brought my copy of the basics of semiotics to that meeting to have John sign it because I saw he was going to be there and I was already a, a big fan of his work. And here is the here is the signed page for Jamin Pelkey on the occasion of our meeting in Lund, Sweden. I was still I was very new to semiotics still at the time and um, new, new to conferences in general. Um, and I remember that John came to my paper afterwards and, and he, he said that was a sparkling presentation, which made, made me sparkle inside naturally. And then he also said, but you pronounce Sibiok's name wrong. <laughs> That's the double-edged sword of, of John in a nutshell. Speaking of John in a nutshell or a conch shell, I'm going to keep my remarks fairly brief, but I, I want to read a synopsis that I, I came up with in a, in a Festschrift volume that's already been mentioned by Farouk, um, published in 2018, co-edited with my colleague Chris Morrissey. If I could share my screen, I, I want to highlight some quotes from John to celebrate his work. And I'll be reading a slightly longer passage in order to provide these quotes with context. According to Dealey, a sign is anything that can be used to change the relevance of past to present via some prospective future. Semiosis then transpires at the boundary of what is and what might be or might have been flourishing above all in the growth of inquiry as the food for human understanding. Semiotics, in turn, 
is human understanding in the pursuit of understanding. It is, in a word, metasemiosis, ushering in the fourth age of human understanding, to which the history of previous speculative thought has conspired to lead us. In this fourth age, we must come to see the human person as a semiotic animal, a being that possesses a reflexive awareness of signs as signs. This awareness sets the human being apart within nature, but at the same time, what sets us apart is an awareness of the very process that ties us into nature as a whole. This realization in turn cast the semiotic animal as a semioethic creature, semioethics being an outgrowth of nature itself, binding our species to nature in a new way, such that we cannot afford to be indifferent and dominate as we please. The semioethic dimension marks the human person as capable of, and in some sense responsible for the careful consideration of life and its myriad relationships virtual and actual, past, present, and future. Meanwhile, we do well to note that the spiral of inquiry has returned to the nature of the sign. And what is a sign? Well, according to Dealey, a sign is anything that can be used to change the relevance of past to present via some prospective future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this time, I'd like to open the floor to Dr. Joseph De Kikis. Hello. Hi. Um, first of all, um, again, I would like to uh, thank the organizers. Uh, we cannot thank them enough uh, for organizing this year-long tribute to John and his academic legacy, his scholarly legacy. Um, I'm not going to speak very long. Um, it's, uh, I'm just going to make a few personal remarks um, and uh, put some context around my being here today. In 1975, um, and then after I make these personal remarks, I will just remind anyone that's interesting uh, that later on in the series, I will be talking uh, in more detail about the academic inspiration that I received from John's work. But first of all, let me just mention that in 1975, uh, one of my professors became the first president of the Semiotic Society of America, um, Henry Heege. And Shortly after that, um, I was introduced obliquely, as it were, into the world of semiotics. And I was introduced to Charles Peirce and his writing. Um, eventually, I studied with Umberto Eco, where I read Peirce more fully. But the great architect in my mind, as I began to learn more about the Semiotic Society of America, the great architect of semiotic studies worldwide was of course, um, Sibiok. And, and so I was looking forward uh, to, to seeing Sibiok and I, I went to a Semiotic Society of America conference in 1983. And of course there I met the the whirlwind which was John Dealey and um, and I, I like to think of John as being the the spirit of semiotics I mean yes I enjoyed uh, listening to Echo yes I enjoyed listening to Sibiok but there was something about John which was uh, very different very inspirational and also a little bit disheveled in many ways. Um, I, I cannot get the image of my first meeting with John out of my mind, uh, no matter how much I try. Um, 
he was he had an arm full of books and he and papers and um, uh, and Charles Pearson uh, pulled him aside and says, "Hey, John, I want you to meet Joe." And uh, and we began talking. He said, "Oh yeah, you're you're the guy that's interested in Mayan languages, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, let's talk." Um, he was a wonderful fellow, and his mind was constantly embracing ideas in many different areas, not as methodically as Thomas Sibiok, but with an abundance of energy that I found in no one else in the semiotic world. And um, it was, uh, there's, there's a kind of spirit there. Um, maybe it's a Holy Spirit because um, years later, after um, attending to my own family affairs and spending uh, many, many years uh, in various parts of Asia, um, I was called back to Pennsylvania uh, shortly after John's death and um, Father Nesty, uh, a John, John's friend from Houston, uh, approached me and he said, you know what, Joe, I think you'd better go look in on Brooke and uh, make sure everything's okay in, in Latrobe. And it's been indeed a pleasure uh, catching up with Brooke and trying to uh, organize uh, John's books and his papers and other, other affairs of his estate. And now to see uh, five years on this worldwide embrace of his scholarly legacy by people out there uh, throughout the internet is, is just a wonderful, wonderful feeling. And it's constantly a reminder of this great spirit that was and is and will continue to be for many years, I'm sure, John Dealey. And thank you very much for this time. Thank Go you. On to the next person. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Kali Viku, uh, member of International Society uh, for Biosemiotic Studies and uh, professor of University of Tartu. Oh, dear friends, uh, dear friends of uh, John. Um, <laughs> That was uh, sometime in mid-90s when uh, there was a conference in, in Toronto. Uh, I think the title was uh, Semiotics, Evolution and Energy, where we, we first met. Um, that was during the coffee break, probably. Uh, uh, somehow we uh, happened to be in one and the same corner uh, together and uh, uh, say uh, I, I knew about his work uh, and uh, started uh, our conversation from the, the point that uh, say I know you have written about uh, phytosemiotics. That was my uh, my first I think sentence about you know, say for him his response was um, no uh, physiosemiotics. I, I'm repeating, uh, no, I, I mean uh, phytosemiotics. Uh, he says, uh, no, uh, physiosemiotics. So, and that was uh, when our discussion uh, just began uh, about the lower threshold of semiotics. And I think that that discussion, uh, we we had it in <laughs> every meeting, every being together, and it it is going on today. I would say, so uh, uh, what uh, what I think is uh, most important about John, from my point of view, that's his uh, uh, his belief into the importance of semiotics. Uh, importance of semiotics not only for understanding the history of philosophy or importance of semiotics for human knowledge as such and the importance of semiotics for future of human knowledge. Uh, I would say John's uh, whole work was an 
argument for the importance of semiotics, probably one of the longest argument ever written down. So, um, and that was uh, done with such an yeah, um, inspiration and depth uh, that uh, really uh, it influenced, I think, many, many of his colleagues. And I feel uh, that influence uh, just uh, now here, uh, yeah, every every moment when I remember he, about him, that's uh, just uh, so somehow that idea um, uh, with with him. Um, I think he helped very much. Uh, also, many people, I think, in uh, in semiotics, uh, his uh, support uh, both to our department of semiotics in Tartu or our, to our. Uh, biosemiotic society, um, we feel it uh, still. Uh, well, he could, uh, I think, do really much for uh, the um, American uh, uh, Journal of, of Semiotics, which was for some years um, behind, uh, and he could uh, re yeah, put it uh, work again and even to raise it into a new level. Uh, also, he did much for American society um, of semiotics. So, um, I was really lucky to uh, spend pretty much time together with him. He uh, was uh, for half a year in Tartu, and I spent uh, three months uh, in Houston. We uh, drove together with his motorhome uh, from Texas to uh, Chicago, where he showed his um, the places where he studied um, and, and back together, um, driving the car one after other and uh, listening his best love music all the time. Um, and discussing about uh, uh, yeah, physiosemiosis and, and biosemiotics. So, uh, thank you so much, Brooke, uh, for uh, your, for everything what you have done uh, for John and for all of us. Uh, thank you, uh, the organizers of the uh, current meeting and uh, all these uh, lectures and the series of events uh, to come uh, this year. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker uh, was not able to uh, join us today, uh, but we did want to give him thanks for uh, his involvement. He's also from the Iranian uh, Society for Ph Phenomenology and uh, Iranian Political Science Association. That's uh, Dr. Mahmoud Reza Mokadam Shad. Uh, so we, we do thank him, and I think uh, Yulia will uh, introduce our next speaker. Uh, and our next speaker is uh, Dr. Mario Santiago de Carvalho uh, from the Institute for Philosophical Studies, Faculty uh, of Arts and Humanities of the University of Coimbra. Thank you all. Good afternoon from Portugal. Boa tarde para todos. It is uh, an honor and a privilege to host uh, this international open seminar on semiotics and welcome you all today and the whole year ahead of us. Uh, I am the coordinator of the Institute for Philosophical Studies. And so it is, I have a, 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 this special pleasure to welcome, I welcome you all. I trust it is uh, not necessary to remember the, the reason why Coimbra and its university is in debt uh, to a significant part of Professor John Dealey's research, whom I have not the pleasure to know personally, but uh, I can uh, tell you that I really enjoy uh, to read his books. After all, he, he was, uh, it was he 
who, in the wake of Charles Peirce, has insisted in the impo importance of Fonseca's, Poinceau's, and the Cunimbri census treatise on science, as like uh, the, just uh, as Dr. Brooke Dilly remembered us at the very beginning in, of this meeting. Uh, not naturally, since I am the scientific coordinator of, my inst of this institute that welcomes this initiative, uh, it is uh, my duty uh, to thank all the entire organizing committee staff uh, and to, all, to thank you all for your presence, of course, and uh, mainly uh, to uh, thank the IAF members who are participating in this initiative. Of course, I cannot uh, name all of them, but they know that they all of their they are all in my heart. So um, it is a, a, a duty of our institute to fight against memory side. I hope this neologism is acceptable in English. Memory side. So uh, it is with great pleasure and intellectual satisfaction that we welcome this initiative during all this 20, 22, 2022 year. So it is uh, from the very beginning, the IEF, uh, from its very beginning, the IEF embraced this initiative uh, to uh, distribute ju very well justified to Professor Dealey on the fifth anniversary of his passing. So I'll be brief, uh, just a, la a last word to welcome you all and uh, to uh, wish you all the best, the organizers, the participants, and all interested in semiotics and the history of philosophy in the wake of Professor John Dealey. Thank you very much. And uh, it was a pleasure to know you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Calvalio. Uh, next speaker we'd like to invite is Brother Norman Hips. Uh, if you be there. Thanks, Tim. I speak on behalf of St. Vincent Arch Abbey, a Benedictine monastery, the college and the seminary. Um, St. Vincent is extraordinarily blessed to have been the place that John chose to spend time to work with plans, sadly, that did not come to fruition in the way that we had hoped in the sense that John was to be this key professor that would bridge the world between our college and seminary and extend to the world that you all are engaged in, to which I'm grateful to be part of. Uh, while he died too young, uh, we are grateful for the time that he did serve with us and look forward to being that place where past and present will move forward into the future with the Dealey Project. I'm especially grateful, certainly to Brooke, but also to Joe DeKichis, who serves as the project director of the work that we are doing now. Uh, I look forward to the electronic communications that we have for this coming year, but even more so for time that we might be able to, to gather in person. Uh, please mark March 24th on your calendar for a presentation that Dr. Farouk uh, Seif will do on his work in design. Uh, we will do that with Zoom communication uh, along with a few guests here at St. Vincent. But thank you all very much. I look forward to being part of the world that you live in and hopefully you can join with us here at St. Vincent at some future time. Thank you, God bless. Thank you very much, uh, Father Norman Hips. And uh, I would like to invite now Dr. Olga Lavrenova from the International Association for the Semiotics of Space and Time and the Russian Academy of Science. Dear colleagues, I'm very glad to, uh, to
take part in uh, such event, a very uh, broad event, a very deep event. And uh, it is a great honor for me. Uh, and I also uh, wish you a Merry Christmas. I am Orthodox and I am Russian, so I wish you a Merry Christmas. Um, I also say, uh, will say some words. Um, uh, I uh, didn't know Joe Dilly personally, but I'm deeply interested in his work and uh, his uh, um, way of reading science also can be um, uh, used like a methodology in the reading of the science in uh, the space and the landscape. So uh, I uh, talk uh, some words about our association, the International Association of Space, uh, of the Semiotic of, of Space and Time. Uh, it was uh, organized and created in uh, 1974 in Urbino uh, by the impulse of uh, Martin Krampen and uh, uh, Luis Prieto. And uh, there are many very uh, um, important professors who take part in the uh, proceedings of uh, this association, like uh, Pierre Boudon, Alexandre Lagopoulos, Albert Levy, uh, Giuseppe Montagnolo, Pierre Pellegrino, and others. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, Pierre Pellegrino is very ill uh, nowadays, but I hope we'll, we can wish uh, him uh, best health uh, and uh, maybe uh, he will be better. Uh, and uh, our association uh, made uh, many seminars, many meetings uh, since uh, this uh, 1974. Uh, the last meetings uh, was in Kaunas, in Moscow, in Yerevan. And uh, the final meeting was in Barcelona, but it was mainly online. And uh, we discuss uh, uh, some problems which also uh, have the consonance with John Dilley um, thinking, with John Dilley works, like uh, the uh, articulation of heterogeneous spatial chords, so the gesture and the world, the world and the image. Uh, the uh, preposition and the nesting of signs in space and time, the icons, the symbols, and the index. Uh, also, we, uh, we uh, usually discuss the overlay and transformation of spatial structures, uh, generative grammars, and shapes of grammars. Uh, uh, also, representation of self in space and the representation of space uh, in the uh, human culture, in the human uh, heritage, and so on. Intertextuality, uh, dialogue, and the interpretation of space and time. Uh, space and frame, uh, disjunction and conjunction, uh, interior and exterior, and so on. Uh, finally, uh, our association made uh, create the Encyclopedia of space, Semiotics of Space and Time, and uh, it was published uh, in um, uh, electronic form. And it was uh, you can find uh, these books uh, three volumes in our website. Uh, if you want, I can uh, uh, make the link uh, in uh, this uh, um, in the chat. Uh, so I uh, am very grateful uh, for the for the opportunity to participate in this uh, great congress, uh, this great seminar, and I hope that uh, the works of uh, this seminar will be uh, uh, a great uh, impact in the memory or in the studying of the John Dilley works. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, um, at this time, I'd like to um, bring on Dr. Paul Cobley. Thank you, Tim. Um, I wasn't expecting to um, to speak, um, uh, so this is completely impromptu, but I've been following what everyone else has been saying, and I would just like to add um, something personal, if it's, uh, if it's possible. 
Um, putting aside only temporarily all of Dealey's intellectual achievements, uh, one of the things that I hope that we can remember throughout the entire year of our um, celebration of, uh, of Dealey, which I'm, I'm grateful for the organizers uh, putting this on. It's a, a fantastic initiative. Uh, one of the things that I hope that we can remember um, is humor. Um, so I, I first had a, a humorous encounter with, uh, with Dealey. This was in the 1990s. Um, and I kept uh, calling him. I wanted him to contribute to a, a dictionary that I was, was doing. This was in the, the mid to late 90s. And every time I called him, he seemed to be in bed. He was asleep. So um, he, he took it in very good humor. And he said, um, you live in the city that never sleeps. I lived in London at, uh, at that stage. And he said that he, uh, he appreciated my, uh, my perseverance, which must have been really quite irritating, I think. But eventually, in the late 90s, um, I was introduced to him at a conference by Tom Seabiog. And Tom Seabiog, as, as um, some people here will know, was the master of nonverbal communication. And Tom um, simply said to me, we were standing up at a reception listening to somebody. He simply said to me when I was next to John Dealey, well, he didn't even say, he just gestured. He said, and brought his fingers together like this. So you two get together, which is what we did. We, um, we got together for, uh, for many years. Um, and um, that, that's what I remember uh, above all. I, I'm a passionate advocate for, for Dealey's work. Uh, absolutely. You know, I, I, I thank Brute Dealey um, herself for uh, uh, mentioning the uh, edition of John's essays that I put together. Um, so, you know, that, that should be clear. Um, but above all, um, he was a great friend and like constantly um, amusing. I won't be the only person here to to relate events with John, which were were amusing. Um, he was always telling jokes. He was very like Seabiok in, in that respect. And there's a famous um, picture of John and Seabiok that's on the front of the um, the volume that, um, that I uh, edited of John's essays. Uh, where Seabiok and, um, and Dealey are kind of, they're jousting together. You know, you could see that physically they're, they're challenging, challenging each other, probably like telling um, uh, different uh, jokes to each other. Um, but I, I, I probably the, the thing that will stick in my mind to the end of my days about John was that he was the anti-Archimedes. That's to say... He had a, a, a reputation, and others here will attest to that, for filling the bath up to the top and then getting in and flooding the entire bathroom. Um, he always preferred a bath rather than um, uh, a shower. If he went to a hotel with a shower, he, he tried to change so that he go, could go somewhere with a, a, a bath rather than a shower. But he had this, this terrible terrible problem that he, he didn't understand that when you put the water in you shouldn't fill the bath because when you get into the bath it displaces the water Archimedes had discovered this a long time ago but John never did so I was sharing a room with him once in um, in Houston and um, and yes every night when I came back he'd had a bath and every night the bathroom floor was flooded and I would discuss it with him in the morning, but he, he, he would leave. He would, he would get into some intellectual discussion with somebody else immediately. So I was never really able to broach it with him properly. I went to his house and he left the tap on for hours. How that bath never flooded, I, I, I don't know. But eventually he got into it when the, the water was up to the top and all the water came over like a cascade. And he looked very surprised afterwards. He, he couldn't understand why the bathroom was flooded. He came to my house on a number of occasions. And on one of the later occasions when he came, um, my daughter was only six, but I remember she was looking through the crack in the door of the bathroom 
Luckily, John hadn't gone in to the bathroom and got undressed, but she'd already heard about how he flooded most bathrooms that he went into. And she was looking through. She wanted to see whether he was really as, as crazy as I'd said he was and that he would flood um, the bathroom. Um, I should remember some other things, but those are the things that are uppermost in, um, in my mind. Um, hopefully, there will be some more serious issues which are, are addressed in, uh, in the coming year. Um, but that's certainly one that I wouldn't like to, um, uh, I wouldn't like to, one issue which I wouldn't like to, to be neglected when we speak about Dealey. One of my favourites, just to, to finish, was that, um, that John was once stopped by a traffic policeman. I, I can't remember what part of the United States that he was in at the time, but he was stopped by a tra traffic policeman when he was, was leaving um, an interstate highway and going on to a, one of the minor roads. And the, um, I'd, I'd heard this later, the traffic policeman said to him, um, do you realize just what kind of sound you make when you're going 60 miles an hour along this slip road? And John said, gee, officer, no, I don't, because I'm usually in the car when I make that sound. That's John Dealey. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Cobley. Uh, I would like to give the floor to William Passarini, Mansarda Sessa project. Uh, hello. Uh, first of all, I, I want to thank you all for being here. I'm very grateful and thrilled seeing all of you today. Uh, several, several people are helping us to make this event possible. I cannot mention all the names, but really I'm very grateful. Thank you so much. Regarding the professors present here, I want to thank Dr. Brooke Williams to participate here. Thank you so much. And I also cannot, uh, I, I have to mention the presence of Dr. Banzalon Tenshera. He, he didn't speak today, but we are very grateful for him being here today. Thank you so much, Dr. Banzalon Teixeira. And so I created my channel, Masarda says, in 2020, because I wanted to share with Brazilians, I'm from Brazil, some authors and works that are not so much known here in Brazil. And since then I have been producing videos in which I summarize books or render into Portuguese texts that are only available in English. And John Dilly is a great influence in my life. I'm always impressed by his profound view on philosophy, by the breadth of his thought. I remember reading for the first time his Assign is What and For Ages of Understanding later, how it blew my mind. Another sentence that always comes to my mind in which was very important to Dili as well, was a phrase written by Joseph Hatzinger. The undivided sway of thinking in terms of substance is ended, and relation is discovered as an equally valid primordial mode of reality. I think I heard this sentence for the first time watching a presentation by Dr. Brian Campbell, and then I decided to be a student member of the Lyceum Institute. And I, I humbly ask you who are watching the ceremony to take a few moments to ponder on Hatzinger's sentence. The undivided way of thinking in terms of substance is ended in relation is discovered as an equally valid primordial mode of reality. Concluding my words, I really hope the seminar will spread seeds of Dili's wisdom around the world. And I hope that soon we will reap the benefits of this true postmodern or transmodern philosophy. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right, we have one more speaker today. It's um, another one of those situations, last but certainly not least. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Winfried North of the Pontifical Catholic University of Sao Paulo. No, I'm 
I'm uh, online totally. I apologize for the bad start. I wanted to say that I was not uh, expected, I had not expected to speak today, <clears throat> but I'm impressed by the many testimonies of um, John Dealey's life and work. I have known John Dealey since 1986, when in Reading, he presented the first edition of his um, Poinceau book. And I have been in contact with him and uh, he has been at my house and at the University of Kassel, where I invited him to a colloquium that he quoted very often <clears throat> on um, the semiotic threshold. <clears throat> uh, and I hope to be able to say more about it uh, in the seminar that is being prepared for me. And this is what I want to say today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to say to all, all of you that we were really pleased to spend this wonderful time with you together. Thank you so much for joining us, for sharing your memories and thoughts. It really feels incredible. And uh, we are honored to bring uh, to the public the work of this um, spectacular scholar and who, who was also an incredible person. And many thanks as well to those who were watching us today and we are looking forward to meeting you at the sessions. If I could just add one thing, uh, Yulia, the, um, I'll just echo, of course, thank you to everyone again. And we're gonna wrap it up here now. So the, I did wanna mention that, uh, so this is the opening ceremony, but the first seminar, the first official seminar that is gonna be coming right up here on January 11th. So that's four days from now. And that's going to be prof uh, Professor uh, Farouk Saif, who we, we met earlier, if uh, I'm sure many of you already know, know him anyway. And it's going to be entitled The Enchantment of Design. And that's navigation towards meaning making. So again, January 11th, if you look, uh, if you're on watching this on Facebook, whether live or, or not Facebook, YouTube, uh, either live or post talk, you can go to the description. You'll see a link to our auditorium. And the, and the main web page. And from there, you can read to your heart's de desire. Everything will be there. So, all right. That's all for me. Yeah, I want to thank you again, everyone present here. Thank you so much. Uh, Tim Trotman and Yulia Niktenko. I'm very happy that you both are here. And if Dr. Brooke Williams has any, anything to say, you are free. But for me, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I very much appreciate all of your talk and the inner inspiration which you're coming from in the and as we move from our present with as we move forward to the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.